as we take our seats, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. It's great to see families, students, residents, staff and teachers here. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to add a couple of reminders. If you would like a headset, we have uh, translators stationed at the side of the room. Please don't hesitate to collect the headset so that you can uh, follow the meeting in its entirety. And we have uh, free childcare for students ages 2 to 5 in rooms B and C. So just before I introduce our facilitator, uh, I'd like to share a few thoughts uh, before we start our meeting. I've not been here that long, but I've been here long enough to learn that this is a special place with special people. And because of that, I think tonight's conversation is going to be personal. It's going to be emotional. Many of you have many years here. But I think we're all teachers tonight. We can teach our students, we can teach our children how to engage in this process, how to put our point of view across, even when we may hear a point of view that we strongly disagree with. We can put our view, point of view across, we can register our concerns, we can ask our questions, and we can do so in a dignified and respectful way, in a way that reflects the pride we all have in this school. Um, and in that way, we can leave a legacy for the future, no matter what happens in the next few weeks. So on that note, I'd like you to help me welcome our facilitator, Stacy Bell. So yes, I'm Stacy Bell and I'm the Youth Development Director here at Sac City Unified School District. I'm also um, the Interim Chief Family and Community Engagement Officer. And I'm also a British girl, so if my accent comes out, it's all Mr. Dixon's fault. <laughs> On behalf of Superintendent Raymond and the Board of Education, I'd like to thank you for being here tonight to support your school and your kids. I'd like to acknowledge the superintendent, Jonathan Raymond, is here with us tonight, um, as well as, I think I saw board president, Jeff Cuneo, and um, board member, Christina Pritchett, is also here as well in the back, thank you. Because we have another meeting on this topic at a different school tonight as well, and in order to make sure that Mr. Raymond hears all of the feedback from all of our communities, he will be here with us until 7.30, and then we'll be leaving at approximately that time to go to the other community meeting that's being held um, in another part of town. All of your feedback, however, will be documented and recorded both on the note sheets as well as um, in the back on the video camera. So we will be capturing, even though superintendent isn't here, we will be capture, capturing all of your feedback. Nobody wants to close schools. We know these are very difficult discussions and they're very personal. And because we know this conversation can be emotional and hard, I'll be asking your assistance tonight to make sure that we're respectful of one another during this conversation. I'm gonna start this, this evening with a brief overview of the district's financial situation and talk about how we got to, to this difficult decision. We'll discuss why right-sizing is so critically important, the consequences of not taking action, and what you can expect during this process. This, this chart is from the California Department of Education. It shows that our district lost 5,479 students between 2001-2002 and the 2011-12 school year. That's about 160 classrooms of kids. We've also lost at least 800 students this year, and we're projecting a loss of another 800 students next year. Reasons for decline include the aging of our neighborhoods, the lure of new homes, the recession, and the foreclosure crisis. It should be noted that it's not just our district that's losing school-aged kids. California in general has a declining child population 
due to lower birth rates and fewer newcomers moving here. This chart shows Washington Elementary's enrollment going back to 1996-1997. Washington hit a high of 349 kids in 96-97. This year, Washington has just 222 students. That's a loss of 127 students, or an enrollment loss of nearly 36%. Washington is the district's smallest school. As I said, nobody wants to close schools, but we need to match the number of schools we have to the number of students we serve. We have too many elementary schools that are filled to far less than full capacity. That puts a strain on our resources and our staff and costs a lot of money. Here you can see that San Juan Unified, with just about the same number of students, has 13 fewer elementary schools. They have 43 and we have 56. El Grove Unified, which has about 14,000 more students than our district, has just 39 elementary schools. Declining enrollment makes Sac City budget problems worse because our funds from the state are based on the number of students that we serve. Because of declining enrollment, state cuts caused by the recession and a loss of federal funds, our district has had to face 10 years of budget deficits. That's a decade of cuts to programs and services. In the last five years alone, we've been forced to cut $146 million. Last year we had a $28 million deficit and were forced to cut teachers, custodians, assistant principals, counselors, librarians, nurses, social workers, maintenance staff, bus drivers, and adult education. We've run out of places to cut. This chart dramatically illustrates the severity of cuts over the last 11 years. Since 2002-03, we reduced our spending by $216 million because of cuts to our funding. Despite years of cutting, we're expecting another significant deficit for 2013-14 because of declining enrollment and rising costs. If we close these 11 chronically underutilized schools, we will save approximately $2.5 million a year. If we don't close these schools, our budget will still have to be balanced. Let's take one more look at what we have to cut. Further cuts to people and services will damage our ability to provide a high quality education to every student on campus. We've heard from people who say, what about Proposition 30? Wasn't that supposed to save our schools? Yes, the passage of Proposition 30 saved our district from having to make an additional $15 million in mid-year trigger cuts this year. We were going to have to end the school year two weeks early if Proposition 30 did not pass. So we're really, really happy that it passed. But even with Prop 30, our district still faces declining enrollment, rising costs, and a strain on our resources caused by the operation of too many, too many elementary schools. We are very likely to still have a deficit for the next year. As for measures Q and R, those bond funds cannot be used to balance our budget. Those funds will be used to upgrade and repair your child's new school and the middle school and high schools that your children will eventually attend. So how did your school get on the closure list? This is about the district's financial realities. Nobody wants school districts to make decisions based on finances but we have to. If we, don't balance, if we don't deliver a balanced budget to the county every year, we will be taken over by the state. So since we're forced to make this decision based on our financial reality, that we have dwindling funds due to declining enrollment and rising costs, 
We use the financial criteria in determining which schools should be closed. This is not a judgment about your principal, or your teachers, or your community. We know that you love your school, and your teachers, and your principal. And that's great, you should. We simply have more schools than we can afford. The district looked at capacity and used a formula that I'll explain in a moment to create a list of the most underutilized schools. Some schools were removed from consideration for the following reasons. Schools whose enrollment would grow from the closure of another school will were taken off, and priority schools were also removed. The method we used for determining the capacity was to count all teachable space in each school, including surplus classrooms that could house students, but are currently used for things like child development, supplemental teacher's lounge, PE prep rooms, etc. We, we then re removed libraries from the tally. We calculated capacity by using current class size limits, including smaller limits for special education classrooms. We used the same criteria to determine capacity at every school. I, I want to repeat that because it's so important. The exact same formula is used at every elementary school district-wide. The only fair way to do this is to use the same yardstick for every school. Using this method, we see that Washington could serve a maximum 706 students, but actually serves 222. We've identified two new homeschools for students based on your address of residence, William Land and Theodore Judah. Also, Washington families will be given priority in the district's open enrollment process. Open enrollment is an opportunity for Washington families to apply for spots in schools beyond your neighborhood and to apply for available seats in specialty programs. Students from schools that are recommended for closure will be given priority during the open enrollment process, which begins February 19th and last through March 8th. What do we mean by priority in this process? At the end of the open enrollment period, again March 8th, your students will be placed in a special lottery available only for you and other students from schools slated for closure. Then and only then are other applicants from around the district considered for these available spaces. This is not a first come, first serve process. Placement is completed at the end of the open enrollment window after all the applications are received. Ensuring the priority status for the schools slated for closure. If there are more applicants than available seats, students will be placed on a waiting list for their preference school and attend the new neighborhood school. To apply for open enrollment, parents must submit an online application. If you don't have access to the internet, you can use a computer here at the school. And we're also offering walk-in open enrollment registration on March 6th, 7th, and 8th at the Enrollment Center, 5601 47th Avenue. For more information about the enrollment process, please visit our website at www.scusd.edu. We know that many of you have concerns about getting your students safely to their new school. And I want to reassure you that the safety of your students is our number one priority here in Sac City. We're working with the Sacramento Police Department, the SCUSD Safe Schools Office, and the City of Sacramento to ensure that all children get to their new schools safely. We're studying traffic patterns and projections and working with our partners on ways to mitigate any challenges that arise. For all families going, going to both William Land and Theodore Judah, 
bus transportation will be provided for students to get to their new school. We are also working with the city to identify safe routes for getting to both William Land and Theodore Trudeau. Some of the benefits for your child at a larger school include fewer split grade classes. Class sizes will remain the same at your new school and a new and larger school does not mean larger sizes of classes. There will also be more resources for additional staff and program for students. With more staff, teachers have peers to collaborate with which helps improve student learning. With fewer campuses to paint, clean, repair, and patrol, the district will be able to provide healthier, safer schools for kids. Larger parent communities provide more opportunities for parent and community involvement, and there are more hands to help. So what are next steps? We're holding community meetings like this one through February 19th, and the Board of Education is scheduled to take action on this issue on February 21st. Following board action on the 21st, a committee will be appointed to make detailed and thorough recommendations regarding the reuse and repurposing of closed facilities. Community input is a very important part of that process. We're now in the process of forming district-wide and school-level transition teams to work closely with staff and parents to mitigate any challenges and make sure that every student is taken care of during this process. The area these teams will focus on include transportation safety, supporting families, enrollment support, and school culture, among other topics. Okay, I know there's a lot of information here, so I want to remind everyone that there are printouts in the back of the room, um, or maybe out, out, out front. If you need any additional information and want to review it more carefully. I know many of you have come tonight to make comments about this decision and we want to make sure that we give as many people as possible an opportunity to be heard. In your comments and questions, we hope to hear feedback from you on how we can best support your student and your family during this process. To ensure that we respect each other's opinions and time, we're asking everyone to follow some ground rules. There are microphones on both sides of the room. Please line up behind one of them if you want to make a comment. We will alternate between them. If you need a Spanish language interpreter, please line up on your left, or on the left, your right. Um, and if you need a Hmong interpreter, please line up on the right, your left. We ask that you limit your comments to two minutes per speaker to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to speak. We have a timekeeper in the front of the room so you will know when your two minutes has lapsed. Please allow everyone an opportunity to make their first comment before you make another comment. If you have additional comments to make or if you don't want to speak on, in the microphone, you can provide your feedback in writing and we have comment cards in the back of the room. Please be sure to write clearly and leave your name on the card. I understand that there's a lot to say, but we want to make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to be heard tonight. If there's a question about the data in the report before you, we'll do our best to answer it tonight. However, we will provide responses to all questions on the district website within the next week. So before the board takes action on the process, all of your questions will be answered, both on the district website and then also brought here to the school for your review as well. You'll notice we have the staff, or you will notice, we have staff at the front of the room who are going to take notes from this meeting so that they can capture all of your comments and questions and we can get back to you. And we're also videotaping this meeting to ensure that we um, have all of your comments. There was a frequently asked questions document when you first came in and we'll hopefully answer many of your questions tonight. Since this is such an emotional topic, if we can hold our applause until the end of the evening, 
We can ensure that everyone feels comfortable and that everyone's voice is heard. Finally, we'll be ending tonight's meeting by 9 p.m. to be respectful of everyone's time and recognizing that it's a school day. So if you would like to make public comment, now's the time that you can line up at the microphones and um, we'll be able to record and capture all of your questions and comments. to closing Washington Elementary specifically have been researched or explored and we'd like for the district to go back and, and find ways to help us invest in our community and our school because we are very much a community school. We walk to and from school, the majority of us, and busing is really not an option. If the kids miss the bus, they miss the whole day. My grandson has had two perfect attendance months for the very first time ever. And I just feel like this is the wrong choice for our community and for our kids. And I'd like to urge a no vote on February 21st to this proposal. And I would encourage others to urge a no vote as well. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marty Sola. I am a member of a local nonprofit group called Restorative Schools Vision Project. Our mission is to provide training and implementation of restorative practices, which can increase safety, promote tolerance, reduce send homes and suspensions, improve academic scores, and resolve conflicts and repair relationships. We were invited to Washington Elementary in 2010, and for the next two years, we worked in the classrooms with students and teachers. Miss Williams' sixth grade class was so inspired by our training that when they entered a district-wide contest last year called Project Green with 13 other schools whose job was to come up with innovative ways to save energy and make the school more environmentally friendly, they included in their plans a, quote, restorative garden, a place where students involved in a conflict can sit together with teachers or others affected by the conflict and resolve the problem in a restorative manner. Washington Elementary won the contest and a $550,000 grant to build and implement their plans. As Miss Williams said, I quote, our students were promised something that would help our school become sustainable, environmentally and emotionally. What type of emotional impact and impression are they making when they take something like this away from the students after all their hard work? Also, last year, the Sac City Unified School District obtained a grant to implement social emotional learning in all of its schools over the next three years. Here at Washington Elementary, they have already been invested in social-emotional learning, an integral part of restorative practices, for the past two years. So why not let Washington Elementary absorb students from other schools so it meets the criteria required to stay open and let it become a model restorative school? Thank you. and I'm a resident of Boulevard Park. I don't have children here, or grandchildren, but I have grandchildren at two other schools, Theodore Judah and Riverside Elementary. Um, Theodore Judah would be impacted, of course, it's already really crowded, more than a third of the children there are bus in. Why don't they bring them here? Why don't we have more children here? And maybe, as one of my neighbors who spoke earlier said to me tonight, why don't we go up to the eighth grade here? And how is it that the capacity for the school figured originally, I think it was around three or four hundred, and now is over seven? Is that only because of the portables? Because most of the schools have portables, 
Why is that an issue now when it wasn't then? I've lived around here for a long time. This is, as a gentleman before me said, truly a community school. One of the um, pages flashed up on your board and talked about the culture. This school does have a culture, and there won't be one when the children are taken away. There's simply one. I look at the waste that happens in my city. We have an instant council person here who's probably more familiar with it than I am. And we can't find the money to, for the maintenance. You're going to save so much money on the economy of scale by taking some of the schools out of the system. You can send more painters and maintenance people and whatever, fewer places. That makes absolutely, truly no sense to me. The loss is bigger than the gain. And we have more and more young families moving into this area. I see them walking in the evenings with their children and with their dogs. We'll leave this school again and it'll be too late. And the kids will be dispersed everywhere. The culture, the relationships, they will be gone. They won't be carried to the other schools. We all know that. That is not what will happen. It'll be over. That's all. It'll just be over. Thank you. this year. We live on 15th and J. Um, I went through something similar to this at Folsom Cordova School District last year with busing. Um, there's a lot of families that are impacted. The people there did not do their research. They were trying to make kids walk three and four miles to school younger than six years of age. They had kindergarten programs and people were underprivileged and did have, not have transportation to get their kids to and from school. So I'm just hoping that someone is doing their complete research when they're making decisions like this. Um, it takes a village to raise a child, and Washington Elementary School is a large part of that village. The kids are here more than eight hours a day sometimes because parents work. And if they have two parent households, everyone knows that both parents have to work. So they feed the children here breakfast in the morning, lunch and snack in the evening. They have after school programs. I am myself a single parent at no fault of my own need that for school program. I work two jobs in order to support my household. Um, if my kid is bussed out and I need to pick them up after school, do I have transportation or do I need to buy a car now to pick up my kid from school after working two jobs at night? Um, this system right now with public transportation is not good at all. So am I gonna have a way to walk 30 blocks to go get my kid from school or not? There's cuts all over the place, and I wish that um, someone definitely take this into consideration. Also, the area that we live in, we already have a homeless and vagrant problem, drug issues down here. This is a large facility that will be cut down. Um, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen to the real estate in the area? And what's gonna happen to the safety of the people that live in the area if this space is closed down? This keeps a lot of that traffic out of here. We want more people and more families to move downtown, but we have nothing to offer them. We have no schools, nothing for the kids to do, and we want to make our city grow. This is not a possibility to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Nancy Zhang, and I'm part of a grassroots group called HIP, Mong Innovating Politics. Um, first of all, I just want to say that we oppose the school district's proposed plan to close the school. Um, we feel that the process is rushed, it's not transparent, and does not give enough time for parents students, teachers, and the communities to have a say or to even begin to process uh, and understand the process, right? Uh, and it does not put the students' best interests first, and it does not look at any other options other than school closures. So I urge parents, community members, and staff to email their board member, to call their board member, specifically Jay Hansen, and to tell them no, to vote no on school closures and also continue to uh, collect sim signatures for our petition and to come out next week on November 21st uh, on, for the school board meeting. Um, so I urge the school board to vote no on the school closures. If you have any questions or concerns or uh, just want more information, my email is nancyxiong47 at gmail.com. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I've introduced at least two board members are here. Okay. I like to look at you. There is this Hispanic 
Latinos. I see right now we have a $2.5 million this year, but guess what's going to happen next year? It's going to make $11.5 million. I'm just concerned for that. Um, right now, one of the key things that I tell parents, Tahoe Park is being allowed all the way until uh, March 7th to decide. But you know what the parents did? A strategy. They went back and looked at the school that they're going to be assigned to. Okay, that particular school, there's different deficits and different um, things like, a, for example, a kitchen that needed to be in place. So what you guys need to do a strategy is go back to the schools that you guys are going to be and how it's going to impact. Okay, and then come back and tell us how is it going to be impacted. Also give recommendations. What recommendations would you give? Because remember, they have to make cuts, but you as parents know each individual school and give input. Your voice makes a difference because remember, without you guys, without in the students, there's no income for teachers to have the revenue, and therefore there's cuts. So we all need to work together. That's why I'm here. I always listen and have an open mind and have an open strategy every single meeting that I have come to, because that's the best way to overcome this and to work together as a team. I know sometimes it's hard just to look one way, but we all have to work together and find solutions and find strategies and find solutions to what's going on. And at the same time, make sure that all these cuts get eliminated. If anybody has any strategy on how to go to the Capitol and get more money or more strategy, please let me know. I'm open, I'm, you know, wanting as a parent to be a leader and at the same time have other parents be leaders. Because remember, your voice makes a difference. We're all taxpayers, we all vote. And if you notice our last election, we made a difference. Thank you. Thank you. for the district and also it affects population in our region. 
three reasons are transportation, opportunities, and science. First, not all parents have transportation, so they walk their children to the school, but if the, the school will close, parents will have to take the bus to bring kids to other schools. Oh, well, also, parents could pick their kids up in case of an emergency. Opportunities we get, like going to the Kings game, like going to the Kings game. Our school also had a soccer team, and now we have a basketball team. Finally, our classes go to fun field trips, walking field trips. Walking field trips allow us to gain ex exposure to our community with no cost to the district. With a great, what a great savings this this is to Sacramento City Unified District. We we went ice skating in December, and our sixth grade class is going to sled park. I think that closing school is not an option because more families move in and their kids and uh, and more students come to our school. Thank you. children 